we're going to start off, there was a, a, a man who was walking through the desert. He was very thirsty. And he saw a shack in the distance, so he went towards that shack, and he got close to it, and he found there was, he went inside, he found there was a water pump in there with a small, a, with a jar on the ground full of water. And there was a sign next to it, and it said, use this jar of water to prime the pump. Uh, and when, when you've had enough to drink, refill the jar and leave it for the next person that comes this way. So now this guy had kind of a dilemma. What if he followed the directions on the sign and used all that jar of water to prime the pump to get more water and fill the jar so that the next guy could have it? He, what if he used the jar for that? Uh, he, or, or what if he could just drink the jar? What if he could just drink it for himself? What if there was no water down there? What if it didn't work? Or let me just drink it and go on my way. Um, you know, he had a decision that he could make to either serve himself right now or invest in what he had a chance to take that there was more down deeper than that. Um, and so, you know, Paul's going to talk about giftings today. And, you know, in using your giftings, it's a lot like priming the pump for God's blessing in your life. You have a choice. You can take what God has given you and consume it just for you, or you can invest it not just for yourself, but also for the profit of others. It's kind of like that jar. So the choice is yours whether you're going to believe that there's more down there or not. I choose to come into the house of the Lord believing that there's more down there. So I'm going to invest my gifts, not keep it all just for me, because when I invest it out, it benefits everybody and me, right? So that's kind of a picture I wanted to present with Paul going into the, the talk of giftings to put in the body. And here in 1 Corinthians 12, which is spiritual gifts, he's writing to a divided church. They're all messed up. Chaos is going everywhere, sexual immorality, everybody's doing what they want just for them, and it's a divided church. He's trying to get them into unity. So he's going to talk about spiritual gifts, unity, and diversity, because we're all different, but we all have gifts. It's, it's good. Let's read. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, also known as pagans in the same uh, in the language, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You know, I've heard a lot of people curse Jesus' name and, and say cursed things about Jesus who swore they were saved. Uh-uh. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't jive. Not with this passage. But Paul needed, he needed to make his message very clear up front so that at the very beginning, the very opening of his discussion on gifts, he makes this early confrontation with the people to anybody that would try to twist his message up uh, that, and try to twist what he was trying to say because they were pagan minded. They were following idols and he really wanted to present it early. I don't want you to be ignorant. You were misled by dumb idols. <laughs> dumb means it can't talk. <laughs> That's what dumb is, it, that it cannot speak. God speaks. And so he says in verse 3, No one speaking by God's Spirit will curse God, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The very fact that you have ever come to salvation belief and declared Jesus is Lord is because the Holy Spirit brought you to that point. Thank God. You did not come to that by yourself. Oh, I decided to get saved today. Holy Spirit worked on you way before you came to that. Thank God He did. But Paul had to establish this point because false teachers were in the church at Corinth and they were cashing in on people's pagan thinking. Oh, these people already think pagan. I got them. <laughs> and messing them up. Now the dumb idols, they can't speak. Paul says that. You've been misled by something that can't even talk. But God does talk. The Word of God does talk. And so now they have a simple test that Paul gave them. A simple way to view things. Pretty easy. On who they should listen to and who, should, who they should not. That someone can only say Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. You, you have people that don't do this? Don't listen to them. False teacher. 
a false teacher would obviously claim that their own teachings are from God. There's a lot of guys out there, oh, I'm, pre I'm preaching on behalf of God, sure. And they got everybody thinking they're preaching on behalf of God. But ultimately, they deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What does this mean? When you declare Jesus is Lord, you declare everything belongs to Him and for Him. A false prophet is going to think everything is his, is his own for his own benefit, not the Lord's. They set themselves on the pinnacle of the pyramid. It all comes up to me. That's denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When you say, Jesus, you're Lord and everything belongs to you, you're not trying to gain up for yourself. You know it belongs to Him. You will invest those gifts, not go, this is my jar of water. I'm keeping it for me, right? So the false teacher wants to be the focal point, the beneficiary of everything. And so the false teachers always give themselves away because they work in opposition to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we have to be able to spot that. We have to be able to see it. Some pastors, some guys calling themselves pastors with ministries, they have it all about them and it comes to them. Prosperity preaching and they're at the top of the food chain, right? They're denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Be careful who you listen to. And so Paul gave us a model to go by that somebody who declares Jesus as Lord does so by the Holy Spirit. If they do it on their own initiative, then it's all about themselves. And I strive hard all the time <laughs> to try to maintain the best I can this picture. Uh, 1 John and 4.1, even John had to deal with this. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, Ray, the Lord told me to tell you, and then they'll tell me something that is in complete opposition to ministry and God's Word and everything about the Lordship of Christ. I'm like, the Lord told you. I heard it. I heard it plain as day. Well, I don't doubt you heard something, but did you test the spirits? Huh? They didn't test the spirit. False prophets have gone out in the world, and they confuse and divide people, and we have to have an ability to discern what we're hearing. You have to even do me this way. What are you hearing from me? Am I telling you right? Well, you're following the Bible. Well, false prophets use the Bible, but what does it look like in their life? You need to test the spirits uh, and go by this model that Paul gives us. Declaring Jesus as Lord only can happen by the Holy Spirit. I declare Jesus as Lord. I gave up everything I had. I gave it all up, my career, everything, to go do ministry. And you can give up, be a sacrifice in your life too, to serve the Lord. So who, who do you listen to? How do you live? He keeps going on. 1 Corinthians 12 and 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Now, that's a big one for the people who always say, well, that's not how my church does it. I've heard that all my life. Yeah, that church over there, we don't do it like that. And so they immediately resent them, not realizing they could be a Holy Spirit good church, right? There's different kind of ministries, but one God. And uh, notice verse 4 through 6. Paul shows us the Trinity of God in 4 through 6. You can see it in there. He says the Holy Spirit gives the gifts so that people can serve the Lord in His body, that's Jesus, and that it's all powered by God, the Father who works all in all. That's the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in verse 4 through 6 right there. That depicts unity, right? Paul is trying to tell a divided church, let's get into unity. Oh, we'll be in unity here at Calvary Chapel, Beth Shalom, Pearland, but that church down the street, I'll never go in. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. See what I'm saying? Don't resent them. It's all powered by God who works all in all. Now, I get it. There's some churches that are messed up, but again, test those spirits, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all work in our giftings, even in differences of ministries. Differences of gifts, but the same Lord. You've got gifts I don't have. Believe it. That's why you need to be here. You know, I don't need to go to church to be saved. Uh-uh, that's not the point. We need your gifts because I lack something you have. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12 and 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit... To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. 
to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, manifestation, Alvin guy right here, graduated Alvin High, I need dictionaries, <laughs> okay? Manifestation, Ray, you're talking down on me, you always define everything. I know what manifestation means. I'm defining it for me, <laughs> okay? Manifestation means to clearly show something, to clearly show something. The people needed to clearly show the Holy Spirit working among them. Is the Holy Spirit clearly seen in your life? Is He manifested in your life? False teachers cannot demonstrate the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not manifest in them. And so the people of Corinth needed to have a clear showing. They needed proof that the Holy Spirit is either there or not there. Which way does it go? You need to look at this congregation the same way, with discernment. Is the Holy Spirit here? Is He working? Do you see Him in my life? Do you see Him in some other people's lives or not? That's something you got to look for. If you're going to entrust yourself to a church... You want to see a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in it. I mean, that's kind of validation. You don't want to be in no dead church that's running the wrong way. Because Paul said that the manifestation of the Spirit is for everyone's profit. Everybody gains out of this. The false teacher spreads lies to make his own profit, but the Holy Spirit, when He manifests Himself, when He demonstrates Himself... He will make Himself clearly shown for everyone's profit, for your profit, not just mine. If I give a message that only benefits me, throw all the money you got in the box, and I go there and I take it and I, I scrounge it all up for me, that's not for everybody's gain. That's not manifesting the Holy Spirit. That's an easy one to spot. So... This is why it's good to stay plugged in the body of Christ, though, because when the Holy Spirit's working in a congregation, you'll see if you're saved and you have that ability, that gifting, you'll see it, that you know you need to stay plugged into the body of Christ. Because when the Holy Spirit works here, it's for your benefit, too. It's for your gain. I hope everybody here has gotten gain out of being in this congregation, because if you're not, we need to talk, <laughs> all right? But how, this, how is this manifestation done it's done through various gifts to each one. The Holy Spirit is manifested through your gifts that you bring, through your gifts that you bring, and my gifts that I bring. Now, Paul listed nine gifts here, so we need to listen to this closely. Somewhere in this, you have some of these gifts somewhere. And before the end of the day, you need to be able to identify what are your gifts. Because you don't know what they are, you don't know how to come invest into the body, right? So he lifted nine gifts here. There's others in other parts of the Bible, but here he lists nine. The first one he says is wisdom. That means insight into doctrinal truth. Knowledge, the second one. Knowledge, that's an awareness of the facts. You know, you can have wisdom, but having awareness will help you implement that wisdom into your life. Because you have knowledge to be able to do it. Faith. The third one, faith. Everybody has faith. Some faith, because you have to be saved. But I think the reason Paul mentioned this faith specifically here is a gift, because some people have this gift of an extraordinary trust in God. Like when David stepped out to confront that giant all by himself, well, I got faith and David had faith, but David had faith. <laughs> he had some gift in there on that. Uh, the fourth thing, healing. The fifth thing, miracles. The sixth thing, he says prophecy. That means to speak forth or declare the will of God. You know, while I'm on this, on prophecy, I, I want to say a lot of Christians don't take prophecy very seriously. And I've had some people actually tell me, I don't care about prophecy. It doesn't really matter in regards to my salvation. And I about had a heart attack, so I understand prophecy. Um, Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That has a lot to do with your salvation. Understanding prophecy is important. When God says, I'm going to do something, and then He does it to prove that He's really God and you don't care, then you don't see it. 
You have a harder time believing in God. You'll have a harder time trusting your salvation will really be there when you arrive because you didn't see God fulfilling prophecy. You don't really believe He's capable of accomplishing the promises He makes. So prophecy is important for us to understand because God's like, look at what all I've done just on your earth. You think you're not going to have salvation when you get here? What I say I'm going to do, I'll do. Prophecy is very important. Uh, seventh thing is discernment. That is to be able to distinguish, to examine something, the ability to differentiate right from wrong, what really is right and what really is wrong. In this world today where we're not so black and white, we've got a ton of gray everywhere, man do we need discernment. We need lots of discernment in the body of Christ. Uh, and the last two things, uh, eight, is tongues and interpretation. Okay, I know what that one did to some folks. <laughs> tongues and interpretation. This one really gets to people. And I've had people say, I don't believe in that tongue stuff. I don't, I, I'm not going to. It's in the Bible. When you see something in the Bible, we're pretty well bound to have to understand it, aren't we? Even though we don't like it. Well, there it is in the Bible. Now we have to uh, understand it to some degree. So here's my take on it. Besides me telling you what I think about tongues, since this is going to be the one that really hangs up on us the most, what does the Bible say about tongues? Let's go to do that. Um, I want to take us into Acts 2. Jesus had just ascended into heaven, and now it's time for the Holy Spirit to come in and indwell men. And I want to give you a biblical setting about tongues, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, Ray, don't go tongues on me. Hold on. Just hear me out. Acts 2 and 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. See, it's a gift. Verse 5, Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Now, I'm going to do my best to present this, to say this. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. What's going on? All these people, I, I understand them all of a sudden. The Holy Spirit blew through a highly populated part of Jerusalem. Tons of people were there. And they were from many different countries, many different places, where they all spoke different languages. That's the best place to hit. When the Holy Spirit's going to come in and say, I'm here to indwell man, listen to the wonders of God, the best place to hit is the highly populated area. It was a central hub. Multiple cultures of people collided into one spot. And what would happen is they hear about the wonders of God, then they go back out and take it back home. And now all these countries are suddenly hearing about the Holy Spirit because He hit them where they all came together in one place. But there's one problem. A language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> a language barrier. And so the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak to each other so that everybody would understand the wonders of God in their own language. Isn't that cool? Do you believe God can do that through people? Of course He can. It says it. He did that. This is a biblical understanding of tongues. That God can enable us to cut through language barriers to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Now there's other scriptures that talk about uh, tongues and there's other settings in this, but I'm just going to kind of keep it to that one right now. There, there's such a tongue uh, that is about within your prayer life. Your, when you pray, there's a, a, a tongue between you and the Spirit. And some people say this gift has ceased and some people say it's not. And that's where the argument comes in. And this, I'm just not going to get into this. I just don't want to hit that argument. I don't want to go there. 
Just wanted to show you the biblical example of the gift of tongues so that we could understand tongues so that we don't snag on that and miss the whole rest of the message because there's a lot in there. God can enable you to do things that you never would have had the ability to do on your own to proclaim His wonders, right? So, 1 Corinthians 12 and 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. As He wills. We do not choose for ourselves what we think our gifting is. You don't go, well, I'm good at that, so that's my gift. That's, nah. Is it, are you investing it in the body for the benefit of all? Or does this serve you? See, there's, are you declaring the Lordship of Jesus or not? Be careful. If you think you have a gift that you were never given, you might be a false preacher, a uh, false teacher. You need to discern what you've been given and how you're using it. The Holy Spirit determines who gets what. Now, false teachers, they were using their own gifts. They may try to use their own gifts, but there will be no manifestation of the Holy Spirit in it. That's how you can tell. No manifestation of the Spirit. Well, I got this gift and I got the ability to prophesy. And they'll come up and say a bunch of stuff, get everybody riled up. But if there's no manifestation of the Spirit in it, it's bad. Turn it off. Don't listen to it. It is dangerous to try to exercise a gift that was never given to you. I've seen this happen. I've seen men who tried to be pastors who were never called to do it. And it went real bad, real quick. Bad. That's part of the reason why I was scared when I came to ministry. Am I really called or not? Thank God He confirmed my calling right when I got into ministry, as soon as I went to Israel that first time. He confirmed it. This man I'd never met before in my life, who was from Canada, come up to me in Israel and said, I got something for you. And he spoke into my life and he said things about me that he couldn't know. And he said, you are called to this and this is what you're going to do now. And I just, I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. I said, thank you, God. I'm glad to have that. I would have been scared to try to exercise a gift if I really didn't think I had it. But when people try to exercise a gift that they don't have, like these guys that wanted to be pastors, they end up hurting themselves and they end up hurting everybody that came to listen to them, that put their trust in them and then watched them fall with no manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and things went terrible. They got upset at the church. They left with church pain and said, I will never go back to church as long as I live. That happened to me one time. I, I'm, I got hurt at a church and said, I'd never go to church again in my life. And here I am at a pulpit. Whatever. Good. Thank God. But uh, you can see the danger of trying to claim a gift that you were never given. The Holy Spirit will always gift people to unite the body of Christ together, to bring them together. The false teachers had a church going apart. Hello, can we not see this and do the math, whether we should listen to these guys or not? I think now, by now, the Corinthians who were reading this letter from Paul, they would have understood now, my gosh, how gullible we were to follow these guys. That's what I'd be thinking. I'm in a divided church. I've been listening to this guy. I realize he had no manifestation of the Holy Spirit. How did I get this gullible? How did I get tricked this bad? When you see people claiming to have the answers, they claim to be a prophet, they claim to have wisdom or discernment, first look for is there harmony in their life. People will tell you all kinds of things. Well, God told me to tell you, and you know, I think you need to do this. And you know, What about their life? Do they allow you to see their life? If they don't, be careful. I invite you all to see mine. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to me, you can talk to my wife, get to know us, hang around a little bit. I, I offer transparency for you to get to know me because of this. Because I, if you're going to invest your listening and your trust into what I'm saying, I want you to be able to know who I am. See what I'm saying? If you see people not doing what they preach, if you see people building themselves up and taking all the benefit and the Holy Spirit is not made manifest in their life for the profit of all, then do not listen to them. You will be misled. You'll be misled. Gosh, this puts accountability on me. <laughs> and it does you too. Because you're representing Jesus to other people. If you're going to say you're a Christian, you better be one. You better conduct yourself like one. Nothing burns me up more 
Now, lost people acting like lost people, that's okay because they're lost. I get it. But when people say they're a Christian and they do, and they do the opposite, I'm sorry, that gets me a little burned. That bothers me. I had to tell a friend of mine, I said, please stop telling people you're a Christian. He couldn't believe I said that. I said, because the way you act, you're not doing what you claim to follow and you're confusing everybody. Pick a side, get on it, stay there. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I had somebody tell me that once. But you'll be misled if, if these people have chaos in their life. Jesus even warned in Matthew 7. He said, you will know them by their fruits. He warned about false prophets by their fruits. What is the outcome of their life? The things they do in their life, what's the result of it? That's how you know them. That's how you know them. If I came in here every day and me and Anna were just tearing each other down, mad at each other, getting into arguments in the hallway, and it, you know not to listen to me. Come on. I mean, see, it's a manifestation. You can see the fruit. You'll know them. Me and Anna, doing pretty good. And uh, by the way, tomorrow's her birthday. Is she in here? No, she's not. Okay, tomorrow's her birthday. Ooh, it's out. Anyway, you will know them by their fruits. Now, the Corinthians, they were misled bad from false teaching and Paul is showing them how to get back into unity again. Ephesians 4 and 16 it talks about the head Christ from whom the whole body joined together joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which each by let me just read that all over again Ephesians 4 16 I'm all over the place the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Edifying means building up. So you see how your share, your part in the body of Christ builds everybody up. Isn't that good? So now you're wondering, what gifts has the Holy Spirit given me? I went through that for a time. What has He given me? It's okay if, to ask that question. It's actually good to ask that question. And maybe you're saying, well, I would use these gifts if I just knew what they were. I'd like to put into this place. I'd like to put in the body of Christ. But I don't know how. Um, first of all, you got to be saved for the Holy Spirit to indwell you. But next, are your practices set up for profiting yourself or are your activities in life set up for benefiting others. That's a big one right there. Hello America. Hi, I'm Ray. Nice to meet you. If your life is set on everything for you, there's a problem. But if you're in tune with serving the body of Christ for the benefit of others at your expense, buddy, at your expense, don't think about what you get out of it. What are you doing for them? You got a right heart set for that. Now, Paul is talking about the body of Christ here. So here's an issue for those who hear me on the radio or podcast or whatever, who do not even assemble in the body of Christ at all. You got that, I don't have to go to church to be saved attitude. And you got that skewed way of thinking. You reject the very body of believers that he's trying to build up. If life is all about you and nothing about Christ and His body of followers, then you have no basis on thinking you have any of these gifts whatsoever. Where's your heart? Is it flowing out or is it drawing? Is you trying to draw everything into you? 1 Corinthians was written to a divided church in Corinth instructing them how to stop living their own lives, reunite back together in the body of Christ for God's glory instead of their own. We have a whole nation out there striving for its own glory, what I get for me, and they could care less about anybody else. Don't be influenced by that. For those of you here in the church, I try to be very observant. <laughs> I do my best to watch people. Blake goes, what? <laughs> I'm watching everybody all the time. I know John is too. Trying to notice what gifts you have that are made manifest by the Holy Spirit for everybody's gain. And I've been doing this for a long time. You may not know what your gifts are, but we're looking. We're trying to spot what we see in somebody, a leadership trait that comes up that could be used, and we'll talk to you. 
We'll talk to you about it. Uh, the leadership will see your gifting. We'll try to give you a way to offer a way that you can utilize your gifts here in the church. But some of you I may not know as well yet. And you're still wondering, what are my gifts? Um, some ideas for that is uh, I just put on the, the website the other day at calvarychapelparaland.com. Click on About, and there is a spiritual gifts test that you can go take, a series of questions that may help you identify some of these. Now, this is not the final absolute way to do it. To, okay, that, that thing on the internet will do it. That's not the final absolute way to do it. Um, ultimately, you got to pray about it. You got to be in God's Word. You got to ask God to show you, and He will. And then come tell us. And we'll go, uh huh, I've seen that. It agrees with what I've seen, what I've seen you doing, and we can, we can find a way to put you in there. Review yourself. See what you have that unites and profits other people but also that requires you to get rid of whatever divides people and whatever takes away from other people. See, it comes with a two side, it's a two sided coin. What do you have that unites and builds? Use that, get rid of the rest that does the opposite. It's called repentance. And you know, these gifts that God gives us, for instance, a muscle, it is weak if you don't exercise it. Ask John. <laughs> He'll put you to work at Haganah if you go over there. But uh, a weak muscle, it, it stays weak if you don't exercise it. So I want all of us to recognize our gifts uh, and to be able to exercise them, strengthen them, develop them. We need to recognize what they are individually. And get with me sometime, we can talk about it. And we'll see about how you could utilize what the Holy Spirit has given you. Because I want your gifts here, and you want your gifts here. Because it doesn't just benefit you, it benefits me, and it benefits everybody in the room. Right? It's not enough to say, I'm saved, and then just sit at home. It's not enough. Because God commands you to come be in the body of Christ. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit has gifted you. And you'll have a God-given drive to use these gifts. Sitting at home ain't going to work, guys. I'm saved. I'll just stay here. Really? Are you saved? Where's that Holy Spirit drive? Where's that manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life to take the gifts He gave you and get into the body of Christ and go use them to see other people gain from it? Because when other people gain from your giftings, it's so satisfying. It's like, well, look what it did for them. You know? It's great. If you haven't yet been convinced, though, that Paul is talking about these gifts operating with priority in the body of Christ, in the body of believers, then look what he says next. Well, I can stay at home. I can stay at home. I can have gifts outside the body. Look what he says next. 1 Corinthians 12 and 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is, is not one member, but many. Friends, this body is one. Many people, y'all got different color hair, you got different traits about you, you got things y'all like to do. Different, that was not a personal, st <laughs> that was not either side of the room. That, I didn't hit anybody, but I'm just saying. We're all different, we're unique. We're unique, we're different people, but one body. Thank you for that, that kind of woke me up. We're all one body in Christ. Now, I have to stress this point, because most people who claim to be saved literally despise the body of Christ. That's the majority. They despise the body of Christ because they refuse to get under God's authority. They refuse to get under the authority of a pastor. And they refuse to be accountable to a church body. That's the majority of America. They don't want that. And they're not going to get the blessing. It's tough. It's tough. It's a reality. But it's a good reality. It's a blessing. They actually stand against everything that God has placed into order. You don't want to be against God's order. You want to be in it. It's a good place to be. Now, I've had it asked to me, what about those who can't physically attend? I've heard that. What about those? What about those? And first off, everyone that has ever asked me that was never physically restricted in any way to attend an assembly. They, they were just kind of designing a convenient excuse 
at the expense of the less fortunate. So that's where the question comes from. People that can go in, what about those that can't? Well, you're not one of those, so come on. But aside from that, uh, as an example, I used to preach Sunday services to people in a retirement home um, who were unable to travel to the church that was literally one parking lot away. We, the church was on one side of the lot. The retirement home was on the other side of the lot. They could not make that trip. So I went to them. And I preached in the retirement home. Now these people were pushing 100 years old. They were showing up in wheelchairs in the room where we gathered. They were showing up in wheelchairs, sometimes beds, sometimes with IVs hooked to them. It was hard, but they came. Now if they can come, what about you? I'll meet you somewhere. There was a, um, in Luke 5, put that picture of the, the roof man, I call it. I want to show you something. In Luke 5, there was a, dis a disabled man. He had such a drive to get close to Jesus that he got some friends to carry him to the house where Jesus was teaching and have them lower him down into the house with a rope through a hole in the ceiling. He wanted to get to Jesus that bad. He went and did that much. Luke 5, read it sometime. Can you imagine, say Jesus is here talking, and here comes this guy in a rope right down in the middle of the whole thing. <laughs> it, just, it happened. What about people that can't physically make it? Luke 5. <laughs> oh, God. I know some people can't physically make it in some conditions. I'll go to them. You ask me, I'll go to them. I'm just saying... Can you at all go? Can you at all go? Bring your gifts. When you get saved by Jesus for real, you will love whatever He loves. And the Lord loves the body of Christ. Go home today and read Luke 5. We can learn a lot from that guy. But Paul explains the gifts of the Spirit. And immediately after that, here he's talking about the body of Christ being two. How many? Two or ten? The body of Christ is how many? It's one. The body of Christ is one. A hundred denominations? Divided? United. Denominational difference? Whatever. Is the Holy Spirit manifest in that congregation? That's what I'm asking. Well, they speak tongues. I, don't, I gave you an idea of tongues in the Bible. Now how do you view it? One. Many members, one body, and so also is Christ. You have many members of your own body, arms, legs, fingers, hands, different members is what these are called. But this is one body, just one body. We're all different, but here we're all one body in Christ. Now I know that in the past there might have been a church that hurt you and it caused you to leave. I know that, I've been there. But Satan hurt you so that you'd leave the body of Christ so that He could hurt you even more. That's the, the conflict in that. But by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free. Now, I love that. Jew or Greek, slave or free. I love that God wrote that. That means God does not base anyone's salvation upon their stature in society. But how high or how low they are. If you feel like you have messed up really bad, if you feel like you're the lowest of the low, if you feel like everybody else is better off than you are, if you feel inferior, if you feel worthless, God's Word says right there in verse 13, slave or free. Slave or free. We were a-L-L, -L, all baptized into one spirit and have, there it is again, A-L-L, -L, all been made to drink into one spirit, meaning the living water that Jesus will cause us to never thirst again, the indwelling Holy Spirit, all of us in one have been able to do that. Doesn't matter what you think of yourself. It doesn't matter where you rank on the totem pole. God did this for all of us. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? He's very good. He wants you. Who cares what the world says about you? 
Jesus says he loves you. That's good. And being in the body of Christ is God's will for us. Your uniqueness, the things that make you different are suited to you for the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you to apply in the body of Christ. You have to be different from me because you're going to be gifted different than me to do things I can't do. That's good. And the Holy Spirit, He does not give these gifts out haphazardly, but He gives them in careful arrangement according to the perfect will of God. They are perfectly arranged, each person's gifts that have been given, arranged for you. And to know that He set a place for you, specifically for you, with your design in mind, to be included in all of this, to say, I'm going to give this person those gifts to do that there, and these gifts to this person to do this here. He includes you. He includes you into this whole grand plan. I hope you don't feel worthless anymore. You've been included in God's grand plan. It's great. Now, I always say this because I really try to make it stick. And I know that some people somewhere have heard me say this a hundred times, and they don't quite get it, but I'm going to say it again, that you are not worthless. You are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you, to gift you, to enable you to put gifts into the kingdom of God so that you can benefit and so everybody else can benefit. Are you going to swallow that jar down for yourself and go on your way? leaving no water for nobody? Or are you going to prime the pump and bring up a whole lot more for everybody else to gain? If you're willing to really follow Jesus, there's a place for you here in this assembly of believers. Not just to be here and just listen to me, but to invest in others. I see y'all talking with each other after service is over. That's where a lot of this happens. The investing, the praying together with one another, that you invest in other people and it comes back to you. Thank you, Lord God, for the gifting that you have given us, the gifting that you have given everyone. Lord, I pray for repentance, Lord God, that we get the things out of our life that works in opposition to the Lordship of Christ, that we work in accordance to the things that manifest the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we have to stop thinking about what we get out of it and how we weigh it out for us. But Lord God, we want to prime the pump for someone else that we all gain, that everybody is built up. Lord God, thank you that you unite, you bring people together, you don't divide and throw in everybody into chaos and division. Lord, teach us, give us eyes, give us discernment, give us the giftings we need to be able to recognize how we're supposed to live our life, how we're supposed to follow you, what we're supposed to do with what you gave us so that we can better represent you. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us the giftings. Help us to identify the giftings. Lord God, I ask you, Holy Spirit, give everybody in this room a tremendous realization of their giftings that you offer to give them, that you have given them as believers. Clear understanding so that they can come in here and say, now I've got something to invest. And people take ownership of something better when they have a way to invest in it. Lord, draw your people. And Lord, keep your people by giving them a way to invest in through the giftings. I thank you for it, Father, that we're not just here to say, okay, nice sermon and go home, but we have something to bring to the table. And that you baptized us all into this body, into the Holy Spirit, free or slave, Jew or Greek. Lord, you could have just said, I'm the God of Israel. I only came to save the Jews. But you came after me, a Gentile. You came after me, not at the top of the food chain. You came after me not rich, not powerful, just me. You included me in. Thank you for it, Father God. Thank you for the giftings. I'll go use them. In Jesus' name.